Krishnamurti, in dialogue with Dr. Alan W. Anderson. J. Krishnamurti was born in South India and educated in England. For the past 40 years, he has been speaking in the United States, Europe, India, Australia, and other parts of the world. From the outset of his life's work, he repudiated all connections with organized religions and ideologies, and said that his only concern was to set men absolutely, unconditionally free. He is the author of many books, among them The Awakening of Intelligence, The Urgency of Change, Freedom from the Known, and Flight of the Eagle. In dialogue with Krishnamurti is Dr. Alan W. Anderson, professor of religious studies at San Diego State University, where he teaches Indian and Chinese scriptures and the oracular tradition. Dr. Anderson, a published poet, acquired his degree from Columbia University and the Union Theological Seminary. He has been honored with a distinguished teaching award from the California State Universities. Mr. Krishnamurti, in your book, Education and the Significance of Life, you write about discipline. And I remember, and I hope I remembered correctly, uh, that you talk about discipline as essentially beginning with the child or the student uh, in the sense that uh, the child must be helped to see the cause of his behavior. But now the teacher is the one who helps him do this. And it seemed to me very clear that what you were saying is essentially that discipline rather begins with the teacher, yes, which would require the teacher to be very disciplined himself. And what does it mean, uh, not simply to admonish the child, but to try to penetrate into the cause of his misbehavior? Um, so what do you mean by that word discipline? What does that word mean? actually, as it is generally accepted. I think it usually means training. Uh, it has to do, of course, etymologically with teaching. Teaching, yes. yes. That's what I was going to say. It has to do, yes, this disciple mm -hmm. who learns from the master. Mm -hmm. It's an act, it is a way of learning, not conforming to a pattern, not subjugating oneself to, a, to an ideal, to suppressing oneself in order to be something. I mean, all the general meaning as it is now used, it implies conformity, mm -hmm. suppression, uh, comparison, drilling oneself in order to be to fit into a particular, like the military discipline, and so on, so on, so on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All such disciplines must invariably create conflict in the human being. If, if the child, let us say, very small, is taught the alphabet and, and how to trace Tra the letter, yes. Uh, he, he must make an A when he's trying to make an A, yeah. not a B. No, no. Now, are, are you suggesting that in trying to make this A and holding to the form oh. of A, that he necessarily will generate conflict? It probably does, but I would rather, if I may suggest, look at it from the point of view of the educator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than child. All right. Shall we? Yes, please. What is the function of an educator? Not the educated, not the student, not the, the, the child, but what is the function of an educated teacher? Well, I had always thought it was twofold. On the one hand, to draw from the person some manifestation of his latent capacity. 
and on the other hand to teach him something different from what he knows now. We are talking about the te about the educator. Yes, the we're teacher, talking about the educator, not the edu not the child or the student no, educator. The educator, the one who educates. Uh, I had always thought had this twofold responsibility, which is, on the one hand, uh, to draw from the student. Uh, no, I'm uh, not. No, I'm not talking to the student at all. Well, one who is an educator. What is the function of an educator? As a, if I am a teacher, what is my function? What, what is important? To avail myself to the student in such a way that the student can learn. Which means the educator must establish a relationship with the student. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is not hierarchical, authoritarian, you up there and me below, mm -hmm. but a relationship of mutual inquiry, study, sharing, communication, all that's implied in the educator, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you are a teacher, as you are, sir, I am a student. If you are the educator, you must establish a certain relationship with me. Mm -hmm. Is that relationship based on giving me information? No, no. Is it based on uh, this sense of you know, I don't know? Partly. You, Partly. The, 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 the meaning, the significance, the authoritarian background of, you know, I don't know. Therefore, there is an assumption of, a, of authority in that. Do you mind if we go back to the little child? Uh, yes, all right. Uh, I, it, we, is the, it is the case that the teacher does know how to make the A, correct? But we'll come back to that. Oh, all right. We'll come back to that. <laughs> All but right. I'm just wondering, mm. what is the quality of relationship between the teacher and the student? The teacher is more important than the student for the time, for the time being, because we are inquiring into what kind of, edu what is the state of the educator? What is the quality of the educator? We said that he must establish a relationship. Mm -hmm. A relationship in which the authoritarian spirit completely goes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you treat me like a servant. You tr you, our relationship is entirely different. Uh, based on you know, I don't know. This, uh, this degree of knowledge. And you are imparting some information to me. Is that all? Or much more involved in it? That the, teach, the, func the teacher is not only <coughs> establishing a, a real relationship, wanting to communicate his information, and also he wants, <coughs> doesn't he, to, to bring about a quality of intelligence in the student which is not merely the intelligence of, n of the activity of knowledge, it's much more. Mm -hmm. So the educator has to be intelligent, yes. in the deep sense of that word, not knowledgeable. No, intelligent. Intelligent. Mm -hmm. the, and the teacher wants to convey his information so that the student in getting the information is, have, is capable, is cultivating or growing in intelligence. I don't know how, hmm? refinement, quality of mm -hmm. clear, clarity. 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 Mm -hmm. And also he wants to establish a relationship of real 
friendship, real affection, real love between himself and the student. Yes, I think that's very, very essential, especially that. Yeah. Especially that. that. Especially that. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, fascinated me about uh, him in the Rig Veda is that speech, the goddess speech, appears among friends. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's as though intelligibility disappears when enemies come together. That's right. Yes, pl please, please go ahead. So, if when there is that quality of love, affection, a relationship, uh, no sense of authority, awakening or cultivating or bringing about that intelligence in the student, then the responsibility of the teacher is enormous. Yes, it is. Because enormous. It's student because after himself. all, we are creating a new generation. Mm -hmm. Which means the teacher cannot belong to the establishment. Establishment in the sense, the orthodox, the the social acceptance, social. He must be, he must be, rightly different in himself from the rest of the world. He must be himself. Himself. <laughs> I'm not himself. That's a, that brings in a difference. Yes. Thing. No, I know what you mean. But he must be authentic. He must be authentic mm. and. In, integrity. I mean, it's not just say one thing, do it, so that when. In the presence of the teacher, the student feels completely secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because with the teacher, he's at home. Not with the family, because the family is too, they have their own problems, their own ambitions, their own greed, you know, they're fighting it. Mm -hmm. With the student, with the teacher, feels now at last here is somebody who really cares. Th this raises a, a question I, I should like very much to, to ask you, Mr. Krishnamurti, about uh, two apparently radically different notions of, of education. I've always been very impressed with uh, the understanding that I think Indian culture has about the need for the student to abide with the teacher on yes, the that's basis of the old tradition of, of that a true interpersonal yes, relationship. He lived in the house of the teacher. Yes. He was part of the family of the teacher. Yes. Yes. He was brought up with the teacher's children. So that the, he, he was the parent, mm -hmm. not the mother and father, but he was the real parent who cared for him immensely. Mm. Mm. And when one, you establish that kind of relationship with a student, I want to learn from you. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me. I'm awfully eager to find out what you, what you know. It then, when you write the A, it has quite a different feeling in it. More than a copybook A. No, <laughs> yes, I, I, I follow you. It, and it, then also, you don't compare me with another student. Hmm. If you compare me with another student, you're destroying the other student. Because I'm, I'm probably dull, and you compare me to somebody who is cleverer. I, mm -hmm. There's this conflict in comparison, competition, you know, all that is bred in. Mm -hmm. But if you say, look, I'm teaching you, don't bother, I'm not comparing you with anybody, you are. So there, this sense of extraordinary feeling of intimacy, flow, friendship, without any sense of you must be this or that. Then I, my mind wants to learn. Mm -hmm. in, in our culture, uh, we, we think we understand something of that when we refer to what we call the Socratic tradition. Socratic, yes. But then, of course... But you can't do this with 300 or 40, 50 or 100 students no. in the class. No. 
So what do you do? Uh, that's the point, sir. That's just it. Uh, given things as they are, mm. you can't suddenly bring about a revolution and have only ten students for each professor or teacher. That would be impossible. I should have thought if the teacher, if the educator was that, had that quality of mind and feeling, he would spot out few of the students. Mm. You say that boy, that girl, half a dozen, and care for them, much more, give them. Yes. Take them home, talk to them, walk with them, play with them. You follow so this sense of... I did it a little bit in various schools, but as I, I stopped in each place I'm too short a time. But if, if there is this feeling of real friendship and affection, love, the student feels completely at home. And then you can say that boy, this girl, you follow, you can have half a dozen of whom you really are your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will be the, the elite. I know in democracy the word elite is something terrible. But it is the elite. Well, After all, you are, you are the elite of a uh, culture which says, uh, give more important, you know, religion, philosophy, to you that's important. I think we do tend uh, quite badly to get upset about a distinction of that sort. Because after all, in the last analysis, surely what is meant by el elite is simply that somebody does what he does well. Yes, I mean, if you're a first-class carpenter, you are an elite. That's right. If you love carpentering, mm -hmm. not because you're going to get $8 or $10, $15 a day, you may get $15, but the thing in itself. Well, we, we have generated a rather curious notion. It does seem to me altogether a dysfunctional one. Yes. Uh, and and I, I'd be very grateful for, for your light on this. Uh, I've never taught in, in uh, grade school or, or high school, so I'm only talking about what I've heard and read. But we did begin some time ago, if I'm not mistaken, a tendency to, to level the performance oh, of students. Right, of course. So that uh, if, a, if a, a student is gifted, bright, and devoted to his task, uh, he's naturally going to excel, but uh, we must be careful somehow <laughs> or other uh, that we don't um, uh, really encourage him too much in that for fear that the disparity in no, comparison but, uh, will... but uh, after all, if I'm the educator, I want him to excel. Of course, of course, exactly. Not excel and get benefit or exploit others. After all, if, if you excel in something, it's marvelous. Mm -hmm. But if you use that excellency in order to crush me... It's disastrous. Uh, it's, that's what's taking place. Yes. Well, I suppose the sentiment that we employed was, was in itself uh, uh, not much more than sentimental. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and consequently... Uh, it becomes we, cruel. It, it turns out to be cruel because sentimentality it, it, always becomes cruel. Becomes cruel. Yes, yes, I know. It's awfully hard to make that point <laughs> in a class of fifty or a hundred people because uh, we we do cherish the things that we hold sentimental. That's why sir, I feel the educator is far more important than the student. Yes, I understand. Yes, that's why I, I wanted uh, to hear what you said about uh, discipline beginning with the educator Agent. rather than the other way around, with the student. There's another question I should like to ask you, if I may, about uh, the idea of a child's behaving badly in the sense of uh, becoming a disciplinary problem. Uh, On the one hand, there's a clinical approach to that in which one might say, well, now let's get behind it. Let's look into the cause of it. Cause of the analytical process, yes. But, but is, uh, is 
bad behavior necessarily caused, would it not be quite uh, possible for, for somebody just to decide uh, that he's just going to behave badly? And then, then it becomes a neurotic, and neurotic is, it is a qu quite a different thing. But the, why does, in the modern world, children are so violent, hmm? yes. so disorganized, so, you know what they are, you see them all over the world. Why? Is it the society in which they live, uh, uh, parents who have really no affection for them, though they so, you follow they say yes. we love our children, but a society, a, a group of parents who allow their children to be killed in a war. Mm. You follow, mm -hmm. sir? Yes, yes, I'm following. Though they say we must, we love our children, they shed tears when they get killed in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. But it, it is this sense, I feel, that of utter lack of love for the children. Because they are concerned about themselves, their look, their hair, their dresses, their... Uh, you follow their nails, their... God, you look at the um, commercials and you see a tremendous self-concern. Mm -hmm. In terms of what we said earlier, then, we'd say that they don't see the child. No, they don't. They don't want to see the child. Mm. Because if they see the child, if they, if they see what is going to happen to the child, they would, they would be horrified. So they, they cover it up and send him off to school or, you know, get rid of him. And the, the home is no longer a real home. And therefore, they become delinquents, naughty, and all the rest of it. But if the teacher says, I'm going to give you a home, you're my children, you follow, sir? Yes. Uh, then you create something new. Not all this tremendous uh, technological information, which is necessary, but this importance. And therefore, you turn out people who don't care for anybody. Mm -hmm. And you have this perpetual war. If the mothers in America really said, look, we love our children, I'm not going to allow my child to be killed anymore. Doesn't matter what happens to him, I'm not going to allow it. The war would end tomorrow. But they don't care. They care for their security, for their pleasure. You follow the whole yes, I do. Mm -hmm. ugliness of self-concern. For a long time, uh, we've had the notion in education that uh, how to teach can be taught. Uh, we speak about professional education. Oh, I know. And uh, sometimes uh, the disagreements between the academician solely on the one hand and the men of the classroom huh. on the other uh, become rather severe. But in, in your view uh, of education, would it be the case that you could really teach someone how to teach? I think so. So what is the point of education? Why do I want to be educated? Why should I be educated? To fit into this thing? To be killed? To fight the, for the rest of my life? Die fighting and die with endless problems in myself? What's the point of education? I know uh, several people who are top mathematically, philosophically, taking work. And their life is so shoddy, meaningless. Mm. They know it. And they say, my God, why, why did I ever even go to a college to end up like this? Unless, I mean, we understand the total meaning of living, 
merely to be educated, to be a first class engineer, what the heck could it all mean? Mm -hmm. So some people have uh, have written rather cogently and persuasively that Plato's Republic is really not a political treatise, but uh, after all, uh, really a philosophy of education. And in terms of what you've said, uh, some of what Socrates has remarked in that dialogue uh, would seem to, to relate. For instance, Socrates' idea that the justice is the internal order of the soul. And all the weight is brought to bear upon ordering oneself interiorly so that the work of justice, which is ordered to external things, uh, is done well. This must have something to do, if I have understood you correctly, with your requiring that the teacher first of all be able himself to see. Uh, obviously, so I mean. Right. Uh, I, I see. And, and if the student mm, is like those people who say, don't smoke and smoke, you follow? <laughs> it's no meaning. Mm. So, and also, said in this question of educating, comparison is destructive, obviously, between two students or... Mm? And also, this whole idea of concentration. They must learn to concentrate, to study. You know, you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and therefore, there's this tremendous effort made to concentrate. Isn't there a different way of doing this? Instead of forcing a child or a student to learn concentration, you understand? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is there not a different approach to this problem altogether? I think there is, because I've talked a little bit about it in schools, various schools I've gone to. I it. think there is too. But uh, uh, perhaps if we look at it in the round, uh, what is very difficult is to bring together integrally, on the one hand, the activity of education, which has its end in itself, not outside yes, itself. Quite, quite. But training always has its end outside itself. So, for instance, the athlete, uh, he, he practices to run, uh, not simply to be running, but to improve his running. Now, he tries... And the improvement in comparison with somebody who has run faster. No, just the record. Uh, that's a record, yeah, with the record. same thing. Yes, but not in comparison with that person. No, with the record. With the record, yes. You know, the person is right. forgotten. Right. It has to do with the idea that I must take pains to do better than I'm doing now. So, no, please go ahead. I mean, I love what I'm doing hmm. all my life. I really love what I'm doing. Oh, I believe that. I, I, yes, I won't I do anything that. else. I couldn't for money or for nothing. I really, this is for me, breath. I don't want to excel in it. I don't want to uh, beat the record mm. established by Buddha, Jesus, or X, Y, Z. I don't want to uh, become somebody popular, unpopular, or this. Uh, that doesn't really interest me, because I really love what I'm doing. The love of what I'm doing excludes everything else. And that very love is the most highest form of excellence. Yes. Yes, it just occurs to me, it's a loving thing to see you love it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, I do understand. And we, that, if the educator can convey this feeling, not to the 300 students, but to the 10 who, are, who he feels are very, can do something, they will, you follow, they will excel without competing, without saying, I must beat the record. 
Mm-hmm. A lamp makes one tremendously efficient. I think a good deal of the objection that students make to grades, those who, who don't like to receive grades, is, is based largely upon this notion of a personal comparison between themselves yes. and another. Now, there are other objections to grades that seem to me uh, really without any foundation. But there is a psychological point here. Oh, that if, if, if the grade is used as a, as a sledgehammer, oh, then, then, of course, it, it becomes uh, altogether dysfunctional and destructive. Still, I, I, I would not go so far as, as to say that grades as such are useless. Since if the teacher relates to them adequately, he is telling something to the student about the student's own performance Sir. with respect to a given task. Yeah, I understand that. But uh, you, you as a teacher had five students or ten students in the real sense. Yes. You would help one of the, those ten to love the thing he's doing, whatever it is, gardening or whatever it is. Yes. And th- there is no grade in that. The more I, I learn, the more I love. I don't say, well, uh, I must, you must have a grade in your mind about me. You watch me. Mm-hmm. You say, well, that's not quite right, this is right, let's talk it over. You follow there is that mm-hmm. relationship in which all sense of making me conform to your ideal disappears. Therefore, there is a relationship of real affection, and that is enough. It's like a flower, a sunshine, and a flower. It, but isn't it the case that a person could indeed uh, love flowers, love his garden, love gardening? as an appreciator, but might not be gifted as a grower. No, then I study. Then I find out. But I may have, you may not have the green thumb, uh, and you say, well, I'm, I'll find out. He turns around and he says, after he's planted this flower, well, how am I doing? <laughs> and And he means to to ask you whether he has done well or ill in the way he has planted okay. the flower. Therefore, you, the way you tell him how he has done, that is important, not uh, whether better grades or this or that. The way you convey to me that I've, that I've done, it's not quite right, or it's quite right, that he's done marvelously. That your very look is sufficient. Mm-hmm. That means you have to be extraordinarily sensitive. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I know how very true that is. Because uh, oftentimes one has the feeling that a student who might not be too gifted nonetheless does have a capacity which still stands to be reached and actuated. Yes, sir, but you see the difficulty. All religions are based on this comparison. Eventually reach the foot of God or sit next to God. Hmm? They are all the priestly hierarchical methods. Hmm? Car- the bishop, the priest, the bishop, the archbishop, the cardinal. If- mm-hmm. This whole hierarchical sense is a competitive sense. And religion, business, hmm, family, is, the whole structure is based on that. And you bring up a child to fit into that. Well, if you say, look, you are my child, I'm going to look after you. I'm going to look to see that you are the most marvelous human being on earth. Totally. 
not just technologically, but psychologically, spiritually, you know. And you produce quite a different entity. Mm -hmm. Do you think perhaps this notion of hierarchy is, has been badly applied? Because we tend to believe that that hierarchy is static rather than, than functional. Functional, yes. It is functional, but don't bring status into it. Mm. The parent, this teacher who, who loves his family of, of students, is still the parent. And in that sense, a functional hierarchy persists. And yes, th wouldn't I mean, that be natural? Yes, but after all, uh, you may be a first class engineer, maybe a, a cook. Hmm? But see what takes place. You are a top engineer, and I'm a top Bob cook. cook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, that's what I meant by functional. Don't let's introduce status into it. Yes, no, no, I quite follow. You the Cadillac, and I the um, Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I quite fall. No. So that brings up a really quite a different thing, which is, is there psychologically progress at all? Because that, that's what is be, what's behind this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That psychologically, Inwardly, you will grow better and better and better and better. Which is self-improvement. Mm -hmm. All that's implied in After all, that is the base of um, so-called religious hierarchy. You are gradually getting nearer and nearer God. The whole uh, Brahmanical system is based on. Mm -hmm. The lowest born will gradually evolve till it becomes a Brahman, then it will go on gradually. Mm -hmm. And whether there is such a thing as a permanent entity in you which gradually evolves, or this whole thing is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a very difficult thing uh, in our culture to get across the notion that there's no such thing as essential progress. I don't... It, mm. So you can see it in oneself. It doesn't exist. Oh, I fully believe you. But uh, I... I'm I mean, what people say, I mean, that's irrelevant. But say, for instance, if one is... If there is sorrow, is it to be gradually wiped out, <laughs> or is to be wiped out instantly. Mm. Mm. I understand. Would you mind if I asked you a question about meditation? Since, yes, you've, anything. Uh, since you've brought this question of sorrow back. Meditation, in the last ten years especially, has, has had a, a rather remarkable press, yes, as I you know. know. And, uh, Brought over from the East, mostly. Yes. Uh, I, I'm concerned to know, uh, for instance, how I might reply to a student if a student said to me, well, uh, what does Mr. Krishnamurti mean when he uses the word meditate? What should I I'll tell you, say? sir, it's fairly simple, I think. As it is generally understood, meditation is an escape from life. Mm -hmm. They will deny this. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Vigorously. Vigorously. But yes. the fact mm -hmm. is, an avoidance, a, an escape, a overcoming life, the miseries of life. Not, and, not working from below, but imposing something. Mm -hmm. And meditation is implied also that you must seek God that you must experience, transcendental state you must get through various practices. You know all that business. Something you progress toward. Progress. That's what. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, no, that is the common notion. Of course it is. Hmm. And it is so utterly false. You become my guru, my, uh, who say, well, I have transcendental experience, whatever that may mean. And you form a system, and, I, and because of your beard and of your uh, <laughs> reputation and circus around it, uh, frills and all that, so I say, but you're, he's right, and I follow. I don't understand what it implied in all this. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a personal experience, hmm? if it is your personal experience, I don't want your personal experience. It doesn't mean a thing to me. Because you might be deceiving yourself. Obviously you are when it's personal. God is your personal experience. Uh, it, it is, it is a, a really amazing thing how, how many students these days have, have got it into their heads that there's some external something that they can begin to do in order to achieve this end. So I had a student, you know, who came to class uh, uh, and, he, and he wore a little bell, a, a little Tibetan bell. And, and the jolly thing, of course, would shake every time he moved in class. And, and uh, it, it bothered a few other students. And I waited a few days. I thought maybe the novelty of it would wear off. And uh, one day I... I walked up to him and, and put my arm around his shoulder and said, you know, uh, it, it might be that the bell is wearing you. And, and he, he didn't wear it anymore after that. Uh, he, he was capable, though, of grasping that point. Quite, quite. Uh, he wasn't offended, fortunately. No, no, no. Uh, but that, that's very encouraging. He, he did Got grasp it, it immediately. Maybe we could say he saw yes, okay. at the moment, and the bell went. went. It wasn't a gradual getting Digested off the bell. That sort of Not wearing the bell three days, and then, and then two then, days, and yes. then one day. No. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, yes, I, I understand. Well, then... Then what is meditation? Yes, what is and it as such? Then if the old... So that's what I feel. One has to negate all the dictum all the sanctions, all the things human mind has invented about God, about meditation, as a means to go, to reality. Hmm? Negate all that. Because it's uh, just a human invention. I mean, all the rituals, all the ceremonies, all the paraphernalia that goes on in churches, is all put together by human minds. Hmm. It isn't... Uh, hmm. Therefore, why should I accept a thing which human minds have put together? They are as dis deceived as I am deceived. Therefore, the thing is to... Meditation is to cleanse the mind of every form of deception. At that point, then, it would be correct to say, even if it's only a partial statement, that it is a clinical activity. Oh, clinical in the sense non-analytical. Hmm. Yes. Because when you told that boy, student, Bell is wearing, wearing you, hmm. that's not clinical. He saw it instantly. Well, our minds are used to clinical, analytical way of going at it. So meditation is this instant perception. Mm -hmm. And that requires a, a great sensitivity of the body. Yes, it does. I mean, uh, alcohol, meat, drink, you know, all that stuff has to put aside for a while. And you have to uh, have a very clear mind, sensitive mind, to say when the bell about the bell, I saw it, the boy saw it instantly, and therefore dropped it. Mm -hmm. So meditation is in the real deep sense of the world, non-clinical, non-analytical, but seeing things as they are in myself. What I am, self-knowing. And the conflict which the self creates 
see the truth of that and end it. All that is part of meditation. And also uh, the, having a really quiet mind, not cultivated quiet mind. Mm-hmm. Because it's only when the mind is quiet you see things clearly. If my mind is chattering, I can't see the carpet so clearly. Yes, you, you, you seem to, to suggest what we might metaphorically refer to as the tranquil lake that reflects perfectly the shore. Yes, but there's no reflection here. No, no, no. That's where the analogy breaks down. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I meant the lake in the, in the Shirley wholly receptive. Uh, uh, Lisa, uh, let's be careful in this word, receptive too. What is there to receive? Who is receiving? There is what is. So the mind, uh, after establishing real order, mm-hmm. and that real order can only be established when it, when it has investigated disorder in itself, and the investigation and the understanding of, the di- of that disorder brings order, not imposed order. Mm-hmm. That's the miracle. Mm-hmm. Yes. Then that is established, then the mind, in the process of that, mind becomes very quiet, mm-hmm. very still. Then what is, is there to reflect? Or that very stillness has its own mo- momentum, its own energy, its own uh, activity, which is not uh, which cannot be put into words. There is a mind when it is quiet is not a dead mind. No. It's not a vegetating mind. It's a mind very, very alert, very active, very alive and highly intelligent, sensitive. Hmm? Now, what takes place there hmm, in that state of stillness, is a momentum of a totally different dimension. It, you can, that's why one has to be supremely careful not to deceive oneself. From the beginning, you follow? Yes, 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 yes. And the whole function of the will has come to an end. Yes, I think that's what in our culture we mean by quiet, having a quiet heart. Because we tend to associate heart and will. I know, no, no. I don't mean, we also talk about heart in terms of hearts and flowers. Oh, of course. Sentiment. Of course. But, but the radical sense of heart is, yeah. is, the, is the seat of the faculties. So, so, you see, I, when you really go into this question of meditation, any conscious effort to meditate is most is not meditation. A conscious effort, effort to, meditate. to meditate. And you know, practice. Mm. It's six o'clock, and I think I'll meditate. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I understand what you mean. Uh, one ought to be. It's one always. Ought because you're doing it, all, because you're watching, you're listening, you're looking, you're mm. seeing what you're feeling. You follow? There's this boom, momentum going on all the time, the movement. I, I think that's why in our tradition we, we, uh, we speak of beatitude not as a state, but as an activity. Yes. When it's understood correctly. You're now, right. uh, I, I know that, that most people think of it as a state. Strictly speaking, that's, that's not what uh, the teaching is in our culture, but the Beatitude is an activity. Yes. You see, that, that r- brings in the question, whether there is a reality which is not 
which cannot be grasped by the mind. What is the relationship of the mind, hmm? mind being the intellect, apart from the heart? Hmm? What is, has it any relationship to reality? Or it, when it is, when the mind and the heart and the whole being is one, harmonious, then there is a relationship. But to uh, try to find if there is a relationship with the int intellect in the sense analysis and all that, that has no relationship with the mm. whole. It's only when there is total harmony of the, of the body, the heart and the mind, then in that state there is a relationship with truth. So, let's forget truth, forget, mm, put aside uh, God, all this, but see if one can establish a, really, a harmonious living. Then out of that comes, that is part of meditation. Mm -hmm. And out of that comes most extraordinary things. Uh, a misapplication of the will then would corrupt this oh. capacity. Yes, yes, I, I, I quite follow. Uh, the idea of meditation as something that is truly ongoing uh, I, is, is I, something that, that uh, we ought to stress a great deal more. But you see, sir, I would say don't meditate if you don't know the right thing. Right. Because all these gentlemen come over from the East hmm, and teach the meditation. Meditation schools, centers, uh, mm. all the rest of it. It is all such. We hooked up another freight uh, car. Uh, uh, yeah, another addition. Yes. Yes. That's why self-knowing is so much more important than meditation. If in the understanding of yourself, not through analysis, clinically, but understand yourself, see as exactly as you are. Therefore, give total attention to what you are. Mm -hmm. Find out. You follow, sir? Yeah, that, that does affect a purgation. Mm. That's what I meant by the word clinical before. Uh, not clinical as a technique, but in its effect it's clinical in the sense that a purgation, purgation. has occurred. And now things after all, wisdom is self-knowing. I can't, there is no wisdom in a book. The, the understanding of oneself totally is wisdom. And without that, meditation means absolute childish. Do you think we might go back to try, uh, at this point, to relate love to yes, what sir. we've been saying? Uh, Earlier, uh, I seem to remember remarking that the, the Rig Veda has the goddess speech appearing among friends. Uh, we, we speak of philosophy as uh, etymologically concerned in the love of, of wisdom. And yet, perhaps in the deeper sense, it might be that one can't do it except Sir. One loves and is among those who love. No, after all, love of something is not love. Where well, loving is love. going on. It, it's not, I love God, I love truth. When if you say, I love truth, then you don't love. Mm -hmm. But with us, love is... is greatly involved in pleasure. No, without pleasure, we say, well, what is love? I have to fall in love in order to yeah, have more pleasure. A dozen things. <laughs> yes, yes, I understand. Mm -hmm. 
You see, that's why this whole question of love, pleasure, suffering, death, we kind of, you know, shut our eyes to all that. I mean, we, we don't inquire about death, whether there is death. No, we paint the corpse so it looks like it it's looks alive. Like, and it's an appalling idea. It is grotesque. Mm. And this requires, you know, really to go into this question of death, love, and living. It requires, you know, a great deal of intelligence, love and affection to look. You see, uh, I just happen to remember a very beautiful story that uh, I, I think the Sufis tell about uh, Jesus, who walking with some persons came upon the corpse of, of a dog. And uh, mortification had already set in and decay. And, and so the shock of the stench caused them to walk across the street. And Jesus didn't. He stopped and looked, really looked yes, at the dog. And uh, when he caught up with them, they, they wanted to know how he could stand it. And he said he was looking at how beautiful the teeth were. That story has always uh, meant a great deal to me because it, it seems to indicate that if one, one sees with that intensity... That's what we were saying at the beginning. Yes. This quality of attention hmm. in which there is no division. So, you see, it does take place when the scientist is examining something. Is examining through a microscope. He's completely, you follow? There is no division as me, the professor, the me, the great Nobel Prize winner, who is looking through a microscope. He is looking. Hmm. And I think that quality of looking, in a, if it can be conveyed to a student, which is to look as before he enters the class, the whole world. You know, look everywhere. The trees, the birds, the ugliness of... You know, look at everything. Then when you come into the room, you, are, you have looked. Hmm. And you carry on with that look. Yes, it reminds me of when, when I first uh, took chemistry. Uh, how in the classroom I was hearing all about the molecules and atoms and so forth, and there was a very beautiful tree outside. And I would wander looking at this mm -hmm. tree. And the thing that disturbed me very much was somehow we weren't getting the molecules and the tree together. No, I would look at the tree completely. Yes. I Give your whole <laughs> attention to the tree. Mm. Then look at the molecules. Right. So that there is no division between the tree and the molecule. You've given your attention to the tree, and you've given your whole attention to the molecule. Yes. Then yeah. you, you, you follow, so then there's no conflict. There is no division. It is this division, inwardly and outwardly, that creates such havoc in the world.